Today's video, we'll be talking about the Hewlett Packard Vectra VL. We got 20 minute videos on old technology, computers, laser discs, and some CDs. We got two little dogs licking their balls on the screen. And now it's time for the show. Yeah, so it's kind of funny, uh, depending on how I space out my videos and schedule things. Um, I did a video on another Vectra not too long ago, and I remember in that video I said something like, "I've this is like the first Vectra I've come across in the wild, and I never come across them. And then uh, a little bit after I got that Vectra, I came across this one. So this is the Vectra VL uh, Series 3 uh, in the Vectra line. And uh, it's another kind of cool computer, a little bit older than the, the one we looked at before. Um, what you're seeing now isn't quite what it looked like when I picked it up, though. So when I picked this machine up, it looked like this. Unfortunately, it was missing this center plate here, but uh, thankfully, I just kind of randomly was looking on eBay for Vectra face plates, and uh, to my surprise, <laughs> there was actually one. Uh, on there for this model apparently and um, I put in an offer uh, and uh, to my surprise they accepted that offer so I I got this for a very reasonable price so uh, that was nice I even got um, this another little plate for it this is for the 75 megahertz version I'm guessing this is the 90 so if I decide to put in a 75 uh, I have the plate for it so that's nice so yeah, it's really cool that I actually found uh, the faceplate. I don't know if this is the exact faceplate for this model, but it, it looks like it belongs. So I believe that's correct. Um, so yeah, th what I'm going to do with this machine, I'm, I'm actually probably going to turn this machine into something I'm going to use fairly often. Um, this is actually going to replace my old tiny Pentium machine. I did a video on that machine uh, some time ago. I'll put a link... Uh, at the end of this video, and I'll probably put a link in the description too if I remember. But yeah, that was a machine I did kind of based around the Pentium 75, and uh, kind of like a slower Pentium machine, kind of give the feel of an early Pentium 60 or 66 without, you know, putting out the cash for uh, one of those boards and one of those early Pentiums. And that machine kind of has evolved over time. Uh, I upgraded it to a, like a K575, and that's morphed into something completely different now, and it's just, it's completely out of what I initially intended it for. So, uh, I think I'm going to configure this machine to kind of replace it. Uh, so, real early Pentium, I, I don't know if I'm going to go with the 75 or the 90. Um, that's actually not what's in there right now. Uh, I haven't done anything to this machine yet. It's complete, except for put this faceplate in, this thing is completely as I picked it up. So I'm just going to go over this machine as I found it, um, and then I'm going to do some up upgrades, upgrades, uh, I'm going to do some things to it. Uh, it doesn't have a hard drive, I'm going to put ha put a hard drive in there, I'm going to install, you know, DOS, I believe I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with the CD drive and uh, test this, I think this works. So yeah, first part is just kind of restoring it as it is, not doing too much to it, and then I'm going to, you know, uh, change the CPU and you know I haven't decided on a sound card or video card or anything like that yet so uh, let's begin just by going over this thing really quick Vector VL Series 3 the 590 so uh, I'm guessing originally this had a 90 megahertz Pentium in there you can kind of see right here there was an Intel inside sticker uh, it's not there anymore I think I have an extra one that I will stick on there if I go with Intel and I I think that's probably what I'll do. I'm, I'm not sure yet. Um, if I'm going to put an Intel or a K5 or maybe even a Cerex in there, I'm not sure. The Intel uh, is kind of boring, but eh, you know, it's the old standby. Uh, I'll probably just go with that. I, I don't know yet, but yeah, just big old power button here, uh, power LED, hard drive activity LED. Um, nothing here. You'd think there'd be a CD drive installed, but there was none installed when I picked it up. 1.44 megabyte floppy drive. And uh, let's turn around check out the back of this thing. Alright, so here's the back of the Vectra. Um, there should be a little key thing here for a key, but that is completely missing. 
Um, right here, this is where that the Ethernet card would have went on that other model I had. This isn't exactly the same case. It's a little bit smaller, um, but right now there's just nothing there. It's a blank. We've got one, two, three, four uh, slots for expansion cards. This one doesn't even have a blank plate in there. And the power. And let's see what we have underneath here. Uh, parallel port to serial. There's no USB on this one. This one's an older model. We do have P two PS2 ports for keyboard and mouse. And then we do have a standard VGA connector. There is a built-in VGA on this one. So let's open this guy up and take a look inside. This case opens very similar to the last one. You just uh, push these forward. There's two of them. And then the case, you kind of pull it forward and lift it up. It comes right off. This one even has little rubber feet. And, uh, yeah, they are really not high at all. So, so uh, I remember on the last machine I was kind of like wondering if it, they were just worn down, but I guess, I guess that's how they are. Real small, little rubber feet. So I'm going to open this guy up and we'll take a peek inside. All right, here we are with the case top off. Uh, kind of a proprietary design. I don't believe this is NLX uh, form factor. Um, I have a machine, we'll go over NLX in a future video, but... Uh, I think this predates that, so uh, I think this is just some kind of HP proprietary motherboard design um, form factor here. Uh, we have a riser card for the expansion cards. There's a little, like, a power connector here, but uh, I've tested this thing, at least to post, and it works fine. I don't think we need that, um, uh, maybe with certain cards, but proprietary form factor power supply does not have that connection, so... Yeah. Uh, riser card has two PCI and three 16-bit ISA. Um, it's not a lot of PCI. I thought the Aptiva uh, we were looked at not too long ago <laughs> didn't have many PCI slots. I think that had... No, maybe that had two as well. So yeah, not a lot of PCI slots on this guy. If you want to be playing with uh, a lot of different PCI card options, you only got two slots, but I guess that's okay. Uh, this thing should be pretty easy. I think it just lifts out, and then you can move it out of the way. Uh, looks pretty standard AT right there. Uh, this front plate, it connects right there for the, you know, LED and power button and all that. And here's where it connects to the riser card. It's got two IDE, pretty standard, and built-in floppy controller. Um, now this board is Socket 5. So Socket 5 is kind of weird. Uh, it predates Socket 7. Uh, it's for the early Pentium chips. To me, building a Socket 5 machine is always kind of pointless, although, hey, on this channel we build pointless rigs all the time. But when I did my old-timey machine, I used a Socket 7 board, and someone in the comments uh, thought that was an unusual choice. They said, why didn't you go with Socket 5? I didn't really have any Socket 5 machines sitting around to use at the time. Now I do. Uh, um, but yeah, Socket 7 pretty much does everything Socket 5 does, just better. Uh, it, it's just, it wasn't around very long. Uh, it doesn't really support, I think it officially supports up to the Pentium uh, 120 megahertz. Although it does support uh, some boards, depending, support the 133 uh, and depending some boards support uh, some of the later K5s. I believe certain Socket 5s, I think it's about as fast as you can go, is uh, I believe a K6 233 maybe. And there are some overdrive CPUs, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, and things like that. But it's just, it's kind of pointless. Um, just Socket 7 does everything this does, but better. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on any points there. Uh, really, unless you're just going with something sort of period correct. I don't know. Socket 5 is kind of like um, Socket 423 is with the Pentium 4. Like, you know, why would, it's kind of weird. It was only around a year. Why would you do Socket 423 when Socket 478 is just does everything it does but better? <laughs> it's kind of like that with Socket 5, at least to me. But if any of you guys have a different opinion, let me know in the comments. But it is cool to have a Socket 5 if we're doing a period piece here. So, um, so yeah, Socket 5, we'll, we'll talk about this CPU in a second here. Uh, remember, I didn't touch any of this. This is just how it came. Uh, we got RAM here. 
don't know off the top of my head what the max is or how much is even in here, but I can see we have different kinds. Um, I believe the max on this machine might be 128 uh, megabytes. I haven't changed the RAM or done anything with the RAM yet. Um, I believe this might be built in cache. Don't know how much it is. Uh, let's see here. There's a NEC chip right there. Uh, chipsets. Uh, this doesn't look like it uses the Intel chipset. Uh, here's our built in video. Looks like Cirrus Logic GD5434. Not sure how great that is off the top of my head. Uh, I do believe this is for I believe this is for upgrading the video. This looks like the video memory right here and I'm guessing this is for upgrading it. Um, like I said, I've been in this machine, but I haven't really thoroughly gone through it. This is like my second time uh, looking at this thing. So, yeah, a little interesting here. Um, anything else? Looks like CMOS battery. Looks like a standard one, like a standard CMOS lithium battery there. On the, uh, the other Vectra, it was a little bit different. It was a little bit bigger coin battery. So, um, switches. Um... I don't know what that is, maybe some kind of feature connector for the VG... Oh yeah, look, it even says video RAM. Um, uh, yeah, that's a VESA feature connector. Okay, so I did take the CPU out, and this is not a Pentium 90. This is actually a OverDrive CPU. So this is actually, at least the marking, the writing on the CPU when I took it out, uh, claims this is a Pentium 200 megahertz MMX uh, OverDrive. So as I said, this Socket 5 didn't officially support the later, the 200 megahertz uh, MMX, but they did make overdrive CPUs. So uh, that's what we have here. Now on booting this machine up, uh, the BIOS detects it as 133 megahertz, but that might just be a limitation of the BIOS. Um, I'm curious to see what this thing is actually running at. Alright, so here is our overdrive CPU. I took it out of the socket. Um, now you'll notice it's a little bit weird looking. It's a little bit tall uh, because with these overdrives there's a little, oh I don't know what you'd call it, uh, in between the CPU uh, and the socket. And I believe that's just to make it, you know, compatible, pin compatible. And I believe all those little things there are voltage regulators because uh, I believe the later the MMX um, use split voltage and they just have different voltage requirements than uh, what these Socket 5 boards put out. Um, so I believe that's uh, just a voltage regulator there. Um, and a little, whatever, an interface adapter. Uh, so I'm going to reinstall this and put everything back together. I'm just going to dig out just some random IDE hard drive and a CD drive, maybe even a DVD drive, because I don't even know if I have reg any regular CD drives sitting around right now. And, um, install everything and then see if it still posts. So hard drive installs right here uh, but it's a little interesting you just got that screw there and you unscrew it and it's just like a little hinge so it just comes back and you put your hard drive you can even take that off uh, put your hard drive in there and then hook it back up and connect it and close it. Um, CD drive is gonna go here uh, Looks like there's these little things you take off and then slide in it. Uh, I hope this thing doesn't require rails. I, I hate rails. Uh, that could be a problem. Um, so yeah, this is a DVD drive. But it is, it's a very plain looking DVD drive. So at a glance it just kind of looks like a CD drive. But um, it might need rails. I don't know. These things, at least this one's kind of clamped on it. It is like it... it you have to give it a little force to pull it out, but right now it's just kind of this and this are kind of squeezing it and kind of holding it in place a little bit. Although it is kind of sagging. I have to, so I, I don't know. It might kind of need rails, but I'm just going to kind of go with it and see if I can just wing it without the rails. Um, it doesn't really look like there's any way to do this per se. Uh, but it's kind of, yeah, if I push it, I have to put a little bit of force, but, um, I don't know. We'll see what I can rig up for this. Um, well, 
uh, we got one megabyte on that uh, memory and yeah the processor showing up as 133 megahertz Pentium uh, 256 cache, pretty standard, and uh, I was wrong about the memory, it's got 160 megabytes installed, so maybe 256 is the limit for this machine, again, not sure, I'll have to look that up, and uh, we stopped with a CMOS time and date error, uh, that's to be expected, I'm going to change the battery out on this, I was going to and I completely forgot. Alright, well, I've got it booting from a hard drive now, um, I decided to go period correct, because I had this 3.2 gigabyte well, more or less period correct, but I had this 3.2 gigabyte uh, Fujitsu drive just sitting around and I just, it was an easy reach, so I decided to use that. I originally put in a later 40 gigabyte drive and um, I knew it wasn't going to be able to utilize all of that space and the BIOS detected the drive, but DOS just was having a lot of trouble installing to it. Uh, it would detect it and then, you know, to format it, and it would restart and it would just hang. I don't know. So I just used this smaller drive and it installed to it just fine. Probably regret that decision later when it dies on me uh, in the middle of a game or something because I do plan to use this PC uh, a good deal, hopefully. Alright, so some of the progress uh, so far. Uh, Ransom Benchmark confirmed that is a 200 megahertz MMX uh, CPU overdrive on this thing and it it scoots along very nicely although it gets extremely hot so as far as that goes uh, unfortunately I looked her all over I could not find my Pentium 90 uh, I, I know I have one I just have no clue where it is so I did find the gold top Pentium 75 so for right now I'm just gonna put the uh, Pentium 75 in there uh, to slow it down more around to where I want to so, uh, hopefully, maybe on this board and this machine, that won't give me with issues with the card I want to use, like it did in the last machine, but uh, we'll see. Um, now, for the case here, uh, I did change the little nameplate from the 590 to 575, since we're going to be putting a 75 MHz CPU in there. If I find the 90, I can always swap these again. And I did find an Intel sticker. Now, I believe originally this came with the bigger one that was blue, that just said Intel inside. Uh, I only had a red one of those, but I kind of associate the red ones more with the 486 era. It just didn't seem right. And I didn't have any of the blue one. You can see sort of the sticker outline around it. But I did have this black one, that it, Intel inside Pentium. I think that looks pretty appropriate, so I slapped that one on. Uh, the CD drive got that all running, but again, I think this thing uses rails, and it sits in there, but it's really awkward. And over time, it like it will fall and drift and look kind of terrible, because um, if you can see the weight on the back, it should be, uh, you know, up like that. Um, so I might pull out the other Vectra I have. I think that has rails in it too. Maybe I can salvage the rails from. Uh, that one and use them in this one. I think that one uses rails. Um, so now uh, I'm gonna swap the CPU out, take out that overdrive. I just I have other machines that run DOS and Windows and they run around that speed. I don't need another one that runs at 200 megahertz. So I'm gonna swap that for the 75 megahertz CPU and then I'm going to put in a discrete video card. So this is the chip. I'm going to restore it to uh, it, its badge. I'm uh, we're going to restore it to a Pentium 90. And I actually, I swear I had one of these Pentium 90s sitting around and I could not find it. So uh, I ended up grabbing another one pretty cheap off eBay, uh, locally actually. So hopefully it works. It had some bent pins, but I was able to bend them back. So hopefully this chip uh, works. But yeah, Pentium 90. I was going to go with the 75 again, but I just decided to go with the 90. Um, some <laughs> in some uh, parts of this video, you might actually see the nameplate for the 75 megahertz chip on there because I did put that in for a little bit, thrown around the idea of putting in the 75 megahertz. But now that I do have a 90 megahertz chip, uh, I think I'm going to go with this guy instead. And here's uh, that uh, 200 megahertz MMX overdrive for socket 5 since I just swapped CPUs. Um, I figure I'd show you guys. It's nothing special, it just looks like a regular. Intel Pentium MMX. Um, you can barely see it. Someone wrote with like a pen. Evergreen 200 megahertz. Uh, barely see it on there now. 
but yeah, nothing super special about it, but um, yeah, it worked. It was pretty zippy. I mean, uh, it, it looks like a pretty decent upgrade for, uh, you know, if you have an old Socket 5 uh, machine, but uh, in my case for this situation, I actually want it to be slower. Okay, so for our discrete video card, I'm going to go with this guy here. This is just a S3 Vision uh, 968. Should be a really decent, kind of period correct uh, 2D card served in 1995. This is more for the professional market where the Trio 64 was more the consumer market. Although, I believe the Trio is a little bit faster than this. I believe this card supports more RAM and higher resolutions. Maybe this card might have a little sharper image. In the trio I'm not sure on that I also have the memory expansion for that card although last time I tried this card it did not work with the memory expansion installed but it did work with it not installed so do a little experimenting and see what happens I tested it and it does run on this Vectra just fine um, this one a lot of them use the IBM uh, DAC. If you find one that has one from Texas Instruments, I believe that one's a little bit faster, a little bit better, but most of them you'll find will have that one from IBM. Now the sound carded question that I've been wanting to use in a build uh, is this guy here, and this is the Insonic S2000. This is Insonic's, I believe it's their first foray into the sound card market. Uh, this came out in 1994 and it's it's a nice card um unfortunately the one I have here now I haven't tested this card yet so I don't even know if it works seller said it does but I don't know um, so this is the OEM version so it's a little bit cut down if you'll see here there were some uh, connectors for some proprietary CD-ROM interfaces uh, Mitsu is that Matsu Michi? I'm not even going to try it. There's Sony right there there's Sony uh, <laughs> those are gone it also the um, the ROM on here uh, is on the regular retail one it's two megabytes and on here it's only one for the sound font so that's that's a bit of a bummer I'm hoping it won't give me any driver issues I believe it uses the same drivers but we'll see but anyways this is a pretty well supported card there's a lot of games uh, you know from the mid 90s up that directly support the Ensonic soundscape it's supposed to have pretty good sound quality uh, it also has some really unique and interesting features. Uh, one of the things is, if you look right here, there is actually a Motorola CPU on board, a 6800 series CPU. So as far as I know with that CPU, this thing can actually support intelligent mode uh, MIDI through the uh, MIDI port here. So from the joystick, this will go, you could connect that to an external MIDI device. And I believe it supports intelligent mode. This may be one of the only sound cards that actually support intelligent mode. If you know the, um, the sound blaster, you can connect to an external MIDI device through the joystick port too with an adapter. A lot of cards actually, but uh, as far as I know, most of them do not support games that use intelligent mode. But this one, I believe, does. So that's one of the interesting features about it. One of the drawbacks, uh, if you'll notice, there's no OPL chip on here. So there's no genuine FM OPL chip on there, which is a bummer. Now this thing does support AdLib, uh, Sound Blaster 2.0, I believe, and Windows Sound System. And uh, apparently with digital sound effects, it actually does really good job. But unfortunately, the FM emulation isn't that great from what I hear. But uh, this machine's kind of targeted for later DOS games and so early Windows stuff too where you know that's maybe not quite as important there should be plenty of games from that later DOS period that actually directly support the soundscape now if you go on YouTube and you put this card in there's actually not a lot about it I mean there's a lot of videos that just kind of have the card playing and you can just kind of listen to games uh, songs from games on this card but no one's actually done a review of this card. Uh, we're gonna of course look at some games with this card in it but if you're really looking for something polished uh, if one of you guys, I know there's a lot of guys that kind of specialize in uh, sound cards so maybe you know Phil's watching this video here's a good suggestion for a sound card uh, you and I don't believe a lot of people have covered so I'd like to see a good quality review of this uh, sound card out there but for now we're this is what we're going to get. We're going to take a look at this card and uh, see how it does with some games in this system. Uh, 
So after about, uh, what, 45 minutes, an hour, I finally figured out how to get this soundscape working. Um, apparently the drivers that are available out there, I'm not 100% sure, but apparently this is supposed, it works under pure DOS, but it's supposed to be installed from Windows. Um, and the drivers available, like the drivers you get off Vogan's, are, it, it's missing a certain file, it's missing the Windows executable, or something along those lines. So, um, if you're running pure DOS, um, and you get those, those uh, drivers from Vogan's, you have to go through a bit of a uh, rigmarole to get them to work. So, I'm going to try to take you through the steps that I just took to finally get this soundscape running on my DOS rig. So let's talk about the drivers for a second for the Ensonic S2000, and presumably this holds true for the uh, later models as well. So even though this card originally came out in 94, uh, the drivers really weren't geared for standalone DOS. It, it really seems that all the official drivers for this are installable only through Windows officially. Now, uh, if I'm wrong here, please let me know, but I couldn't find any official standalone DOS drivers. They all wanted you to install through Windows 3.1 or 95 slash 98 for the drivers. And when you did install those drivers, you got the option and it would automatically set it up in DOS. And it worked fairly well, as you'll see later on in the video. But if you have a machine that just has DOS on it and you're not running Windows uh, 3.1 or up, it can be a little tricky to install this card. Now, if you go to Vogan's drivers, and that's a great resource, I go there for a lot of drivers, uh, you'll find a driver package there and it's for, says it's for DOS. And um, what it really is, is just like a hacked version of the drivers. And if you just try to use these drivers to install it in pure DOS, it's not gonna work. It's missing a couple things. But thankfully there is a very helpful uh, web page to help you figure out what, what add what's missing here and get these to work if you do choose to install it in pure DOS and I I did reference this um, this web page and I set it up in pure DOS and it did work if you follow the instruction okay so the website you want to go to is uh, how to install an Insonic Soundstage Opus card it will work with the S2000 uh, and the other models I believe as well it worked with my S2000 um, I'm not gonna go into great de details with this if you wanna check it out you can check out the web page uh, I'll put a link in the description, provided I remember to, or put it in a little card that may be popping up right now if I remember to add it. Um, but anyways, this webpage basically goes through what you need to do to uh, with these modified DOS drivers uh, to make them work in pure DOS. And basically you just have to create a INI file and uh, do a little put that in with the, the drivers and set it all up. It's not too hard. Um, just Go to that web page if you want to set this card up uh, in pure DOS and it will go through the steps on how you need to do it. Um, but I did it and it worked fine in a pure DOS environment. Now that we have basically everything set up, we've got our video card, our sound card, uh, our hard drive set up and everything, I really wanted to install some version of Windows on this. I, I thought about Windows 95, but I think I would just go with 3.1. It, it matches the 1994 ish time frame we're going here uh, for here a little bit better um, although Windows 95 and 98 should run fine on this machine uh, unfortunately I had a lot of problems trying to install Windows 3.1 it just uh, would not install it kept giving me this error uh, it would start installing and then it would fail and it's probably because I just tossed in a hard drive that already had DOS on it from a different machine and I'm, I'm sure there was something weird going on there. Alright, so I didn't like the fact that I wasn't able to load Windows on here because this is, this machine is would be really good for uh, Windows 3.1, especially considering the time frame and even, you know, 95 or 98 if you wanted. Um, but I just couldn't get it to work. I kept running into that air and uh, so I just decided to use a different hard drive and uh, I reformatted this hard drive, I reinstalled DOS and then I was able to uh, install Windows 3.1 just fine and, and that makes sense because the other hard drive I had in here is actually was just like a straight pull from another system uh, you really shouldn't do that with a, with a new system adding a hard drive you should always reformat and reinstall your OS but I was just being lazy so uh, it seems to work just fine um, with the new hard drive I've added and uh, after I installed Windows 3.1, I uh, put on the 
drivers for the Soundscape for Windows 3.1 and uh, installed just fine and it set everything up in DOS. Um, so if you do have Windows, uh, the installation process for the Soundscapes uh, much simpler. Uh, I did run into a hitch though with the MIDI configuration. Uh, IRQ7 uh, for the MIDI was being taken up by the parallel port. And unfortunately the BIOS on this thing is pretty limited. Uh, it only allowed me so to select IRQ5 or 7 for the parallel port. And I needed both of those for the sound card. So uh, for now I've disabled the parallel port. Uh, I'm really not going to be using it much. Uh, so maybe if I want to attach an external uh, zip drive or something, I can just always re uh, activate it and move some things around with IRQ if I really need that parallel port working but you know I could set I was able to set the MIDI to like IRQ 10 if I wanted but certain games like Panzer General just didn't give me the option of selecting IRQ 10 um, so 5 and 7 I think are a lot more standard so that should uh, give me a lot more compatibility with games so it seems to be working uh, just fine now in DOS and Windows 3.1 Alright, so let's take a look at a couple games now on this machine with the Soundscape and the S3 video card and see how it performs. Um, so for all these games, if there was the option to natively select uh, and Sonic Soundscape in the setup for sound, I would put, pick the Soundscape. Uh, if there wasn't an option for music for the Soundscape, I would pick um, General MIDI. Uh, so we're not using an external MIDI device. This is all coming from the Soundscape card itself. Um, I believe in some cases, if there wasn't Soundscape for digital effects either, um, this card emulates the Sound Blaster. So um, I did these tests. That all these, I ran all these games like two or three weeks ago, so I don't quite remember at the moment. But I believe there might have been one that I had to set it for Sound Blaster. It didn't have any options for Soundscape, um, I believe. So uh, enjoy.
So one thing I did want to test on this, uh, specifically with that uh, N-Sonic Soundscape card, is uh, intelligent mode through the port in the back. So uh, I'm going to hook it up to this MT32. I've actually, uh, it's usually not the wisest thing to test things on things that you don't know are working, but <laughs> um, this is actually my second MT32. I actually picked this up at a place called Zia Records uh, locally. It's like a record shop, but they have... Some, you know, laser discs and movies and computer games sometimes and video games. and st It's one of those kind of places. And um, they had this one and it was on sale. And it wasn't like a super deal. It wasn't like 20 bucks. But it was too good to pass up. So I picked this guy up. Haven't tested it yet. Uh, but we're going to test it on this card uh, using one of these sort of sound card to external MIDI adapters. And uh, we'll see if the soundscape uh, does support uh, intelligent mode. Uh... But if you are using an external MIDI device uh, with the Soundscape, don't forget to go into the uh, setup, the SSINIT. 
and select, sorry, doing this with one hand, um, select advanced, and then up here go to MIDI, and be sure to set it from internal to external, and then uh, accept those changes. Alright, so the MT32 does seem to work, uh, although this is Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, so uh, this is not a game that uses intelligent mode, but I just wanted to test this game out on it real quick. And um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound good through the speakers on the monitor, but uh, as you can hear, uh, it is at least working uh, with non-intelligent mode uh, games using the MT32. So. Now I'm going to try to uh, use a game that does use intelligent mode. Alright, so we've got uh, Heroes Quest here installed, and this is a game that does need intelligent mode with the MT32, and uh, that's a good sign. So we're going to run the introduction. I, I think I already know it's working because um, I remember I used this with through a Sound Blaster 16 before this method through the port, and it would just lock up. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it definitely does appear that the uh, Soundscape S2000 uh, can play intelligent mode games through the MIDI port on the sound card, which is nice. So, uh, yeah, sorry for that volume. I had the volume all the way up just because these are really bad speakers, and I just wanted to make sure uh, we could all hear it working. And, uh, while I had this thing out, I wanted to test this guy that I picked up uh, a few months ago. I haven't got to test it. It's an SC, um, a Roland SC88, which is kind of like uh, it came out after the SC55. It does have an SC55 mode. Um, I've heard some different things. A select few games actually sound better on this thing than, a, than an SC55, but I don't know. It all just kind of seems inconclusive, um, but I wanted to test it out if it worked. Um, so I have it still hooked up to that joystick port, um, and I have it with uh, Panzer General, and I have it set to General MIDI, although it doesn't, doesn't really sound right. <laughs> I mean, it's not... I don't know, I haven't played this game extensively, so I don't know if that's how it's supposed to sound. Um, but to me, it doesn't sound quite right, uh, so I don't know. Uh, but at least it seems to be working. It might just need, you know, tuned or settings set a certain way. So, yeah, just wanted to throw that in there. Alright, and that is the Hewlett Packard Vectra VL uh, Series 3, uh, Model 5 slash 90. And, uh, yeah, I've said it in the previous video that I did with the Vectra. I like the Vectra line for whatever reason. I, it just appeals to me. Um, they generally are more business-oriented. And this machine is still kind of more business-oriented. Not quite as much as the last one we looked at, but it's still... Sort of, you can tell, it's kind of meant for business, but it, it also makes, uh, or would have made a fine, you know, home computer. Uh, it's a Socket 5 machine, uh, kind of, I, ha I actually haven't had a lot of Socket 5 machines uh, with me here, so uh, kind of glad to have a up and running, uh, useful Socket 5 machine, although I still stick with what I said before, um, there's really nothing a Socket 5 machine does that a Socket 7 uh, doesn't do just as well. Uh, and or better. I, there, there's really, there really isn't much of a reason to have, there isn't a reason in my opinion to have a Socket 5 machine in your collection uh, unless you're just going with period correctness uh, which we kind of are here but you know just usually I would just say go with the Socket 7 but um, yeah it's kind of cool. Uh, it was cool to get the overdrive chip but we went uh, we went back with what it was stock with the Pentium 90 and uh, it's ran fine. A um, couple issues, the BIOS is a little bit limiting um, but other than that, you know, it's a cool machine. It doesn't have the cool Vectra splash screen <laughs> that the other Vectra we looked at did, but uh, it's still a decent machine. A uh, little bit limited with our uh, bays here, uh, but, you know, for this era uh, of PC retro gaming and usage, you're fine with a, a regular, like, 144 megabyte floppy drive and a CD drive. That's, that's going to get you, like, pretty much uh, all your games are going to be available. Uh, in either of these formats. I don't really need anything else. Uh, really pretty simple. Just got a power button here. Um, yeah, it's a nice machine. I, I, I do like it. Um, I'm probably going to be putting this, uh, setting it up uh, for a lot of usage 
Uh, I really want to get some usage out of that and Sonic card. I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. I do like this Vectra. Uh, you can, you can, if you need to upgrade the CPU, you got a lot of options. Um, not as much as Socket 7, but there are, uh, you know, upgrade uh, CPUs out there for Socket 5. A uh, little bit, uh, as I said, your expansion options are a little bit less as what they'd be uh, if you had a tower or whatnot, but it's still a pretty cool system. Video card that we put in there, the, uh, the S3 uh, Vision, that should be great with a lot of 2D games. No 3D potential there. Uh, I know I'll get in the comments, I inevitably always get a comment, add a Voodoo card. Yes, you can add a Voodoo card to this. I, I don't know if I'll be doing that in the future. I, I might. I might throw a, a Voodoo in there. Uh, Voodoo 1. Uh, actually, I probably will now that I think about it. So I will probably do that. So you can always do that for 3D acceleration. Uh, great combo, I think. Uh, S3 card for 2D, and then you throw in a uh, Voodoo. That's a pretty good combination for those uh, early, early days. All right, well, I had the thing out anyways, and I had this clear by, so, okay, we'll just put a uh, Voodoo 1 in this thing now. It seems pretty appropriate that it would go in this, but I feel like this card gets switched into a mach new machine, like, every other month or something, but, okay, we'll add the 3DFX uh, card. If I have any issues with it, I'll make an update video, but in this machine, I think it should work uh, just fine. I don't have Windows 95 on here. Some of the parts in the video earlier, you might have seen a Windows 95 sticker. I put one on. I was going to put Windows 95 on it, but for right now, I'm just going to stick with Windows 3.1 and DOS. Um, okay, so let's talk about the sound card just for a minute. Uh, again, this, wasn't, this video wasn't any kind of comprehensive uh, video about that and Sonic sound card. I just want to make that clear. But it's a really interesting, cool card. Did confirm that the joystick port on it does work with intelligent mode, uh, which is really nice if you want to play those old, uh, you know, Sierra Adventure games, those older games that use an MT32 uh, with intelligent mode. I want to say again, the Insonic S2000 sound card that we did have in here, uh, it's kind of the lowest version of it. It only had the one megabyte uh, ROM on it. Uh, I'd really like to get my hands on one of the better ones with the two megabyte ROM. Uh, I've heard they sound a lot better, and there's also an Elite version um, that I believe... I think the ROM on that's still 2 megabytes, I'm not 100% sure, that might be bigger, um, but I know it has like a better sound to noise ratio, things like that. Uh, I'd really be interested to hear how those sound, but as far as this card with the uh, 1 megabyte ROM chip on it, I think it sounds pretty good, uh, pretty decent general MIDI on it. Downsides of the audio card, uh, the Insonic uh, soundscapes, in general, it seems, you know, the drivers, once you get them installed, they, they work fine. Uh, if you've got Windows 3.1 or 95 on your machine, installation doesn't seem to be a problem at all, and it automatically sets things up for DOS. But if you're uh, putting them in a pure DOS machine, you've got to do a little bit of trickery with the install, because uh, since apparently they really weren't meant for pure DOS machines. Another thing to keep in mind with the soundscapes is they really were meant for later DOS games and earlier Windows games. There's no OPL uh, True FM chip on there, which kind of sucks. Uh, but the general MIDI, in my opinion, on those sounds pretty good. Um, they seem to have decent support with later games, and they do emulate Sound Blaster. Uh, but then again, remember, there's no real FM chip on those. Um, I believe you can pair them with another sound card uh, fairly easily. I haven't tried it. Uh, but I believe they were made to be paired with a card that does have an FM chip if you want to. Um, you can always do that. I try to tend to avoid putting two sound cards in a system. Uh, especially I wouldn't do it with this with the... I'm already low on, uh, you know, DMA and IRQs for this machine, so... Uh, but you can, uh, in the drivers, you can disable the Sound Blaster uh, emulation. So that would free up some resources for you to put in other sound cards. So that's an option. But I don't know, maybe maybe if I get one of the nicer ones, like the Elite, uh, maybe I'll do a review video on just the sound card. Um, or, you know, hopefully someone else out there. There's a lot of other retro computer guys that do videos. Uh, maybe one of those guys will do a more comprehensive video on one of those sound cards. Because they're interesting. I think they deserve a more comprehensive video. So yeah, that's the Vector VL. Decent machine, uh, kind of business oriented, but I do like it. And I'm probably going to be using this machine a lot more. So, thanks for watching my video. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, subscribe, hit that like button, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.